your critique the deception campaign, they said, well, it really wasn't a success of deception. The deception campaign didn't work. Instead, it was a success of security. Of course, that could cover anything. But then when you read into the writing, the Germans had the right information. They had all kinds of information, some right and some wrong. They couldn't sort it out. It was a success of ambiguity, and we couldn't even say it. Now, I've illustrated something there. Does anybody understand what I illustrate? How many times in the past have you seen in the paper or official pronouncements or documents where they say, oh, we had the information to what was going to happen after the operation. <coughs> what they didn't tell you the information they had that they also thought was going to happen wasn't incorrect. How many times have you seen in the paper they tell them, say, oh, we had it, CIA, oh, God, yeah, we knew it. we had that information. But they didn't tell you the other information they had that didn't agree with that, and they weren't sure what was right and what was wrong. So they were correct. They said they had the right information, but they failed to tell you those other information they had that wasn't right, which they weren't sure what was right. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about. Another example, the invasion of Italy after Sicily. Remember, we didn't intend to invade Italy. We were exploiting an existing situation because we were successful in Sicily there, fall of Mussolini government, etc. Who was it? Hey, boy, let's exploit this situation. Christ, the whole thing turned into a fiasco. We had all kinds of problems. Salerno, Anzio, etc. So once again, they said, why? They said, how come we couldn't get a good deception campaign anymore? And the secretary said, hey, we didn't have time to set up a deception campaign. Which is correct, it takes time. Well, you, don't, you can't stop to stop the war to set up a deception campaign. You have to exploit an existing situation. And that's the time to use ambiguity. When you get a blitzkrieg going, you may have deception to start it. Once it goes, you're actually moving on ambiguity. The other guy can't keep up. One more example before I go on. The invasion of Normandy, a beautiful deception campaign. We had the Germans believe we were going to go into Pas de Claire. Had them convinced we were going to go into Pas de Claire. For over 30 days, even when we were after the beach, all those ships and troops going in, they said, boy, the main effort's really coming elsewhere. Damn good thing, because we still had a hard time. That was extraordinary. But remember, we set that up many months ahead of time to get that image in their minds and couldn't shake it corporate. They couldn't, even though some of them knew that it was the wrong image corporately, they were unable to shake that image. Okay, so here you're generating many non cooperative mental centers of gravity in order to slow them down so we can't cope. Here you're giving them price, you've got a good picture, wrong picture, you're doing exactly the wrong thing. If you can get away with it, of course they find out. Boy, they read through the deception, you're in deep trouble. Fast transit, not only quick, we're irregular. In other words, you can not only shift gears, but they also can't get an image of what's going on. Your effort. The idea is to punch into those parts, allow them to retain their organic holes. Get those connections out and retain their holes so you can pull them apart. We talked about that earlier. So if you pull all those things together, here's your payoff. You're trying to disorient. Deliberately generate a mismatch between what you see and that which you must react or adapt to. Keyword, mismatch. That's disorientation. So if you think about that, if that's the way you define disorientation, now you can redefine surprise. Surprise is nothing more than a form of disorientation. It's not defined that way in dictionaries or textbooks, but it's nothing more than a form of disorientation. And it's usually generated by perceiving extreme change over a short period of time. Perceiving, I didn't say it was done that way. In other words, how many times in your life you've seen something going on, all of a sudden you realize it's going on for a long time, oh my God. Or it can be done because it's quick, or a combination. So you can generate this with ambiguity, deception, etc., or any combination. I proceed. And shock is nothing more than what you call a paralyzing state of disorientation. So awesome, it's paralyzed. You can't react, you can't adapt. So in that sense, shock is what I call a hard form of surprise. And disrupt, the state of being split apart, broken up, or torn asunder. In other words, generate as many non cooperative centers of gravity. So here are these things you're doing. Here's the payoff. There's your aim. Once again, natural fallout, natural consequence. But now let's ask ourselves a question. Surprise and shock are a form of disorientation. Why not just remove them from the board and only use disorientation and disruption? You might want to do that, but then again, let's be careful before we jump into the bag. Let's examine surprise and shock a bit more before we make that decision. And here's a note directed to You can represent overload beyond what's needed to go to the responder or that way. 
In other words, when you're surprised, in a sense, you're overloaded, even if it's for a short period of time. So surprise and shock, in other sense, is exhibiting overload. So if that's the case, let's re reset up. And here's basically what we're trying to do. We're trying to do these things. We're trying to disorient the guy, disrupt the guy, and we're trying to overload him. So he can't cope, he can't keep up. Note that a welfare threatening event is referenced to one's mental or physical capacity to adapt or endure. Think about your own life. There's times when sometimes a lot of things happen, but we have a hard time with that. Now, go for it. Oh, you try to back off, and people usually let you off the hook. What if they don't? You're in deep trouble. <laughs> Think of the aim this way, or you think of it that way. But now look at that chart. What's the what's the highest content there? That has a high mental content. Attrition has a high physical content. Maneuver has a high mental content. Let's look at it. You see, I think it's awesome. High mental. Content. You see, most often you see in newspapers talking about maneuvers by troops going down this highway or that. You don't get the whole thing. You've got to bring in the mental aspect. You don't dislocate a mind. You disorient. And when a guy's mentally disoriented, is he coping with the situation or he's isolated from it? So you've got mental isolation. discomfort at the front. In other words, you're going to be able to share the same goddamn problems other people share. Then they know you understand. Willingness to support and promote even unconventional and difficult supporters. They can do these kinds, accept danger, demonstrate initiative, take risks, etc. As a matter of fact, in the German equivalent to what we call our OER, does everybody know what OER means? Officers Effectiveness Report. Their equivalent, their system, up at least to World War II. They had a statement in there, a code word they put in there, this officer is a difficult subordinate. You know what that meant? Promote early. And our system is two. <laughs> and he explains it very well. He says, the reason why is if you've got a guy that has these characteristics, that means he's going to be a pain in the rear to a superior. Automatic. Because he's going to have different ideas. The guy's, gee, you know. It's different. You're doing it different. We didn't do it that way. You've heard people say, so what? The question is, has it been thought through? Can it be done in that kind? And is it within your, 
your moral culture. And she answered yes to that, then what's all this nonsense? And you can't violate your culture either, but as long as we're missing, what's all this garbage about? Also, dedication resolved to face a master of the circuit that applies to face your traditional sources, and we'll be able to think of it a different way. Instead of having the so-called definitive or elegant solution, or that one we've used, the standard solution for the last 10 years. And the benefit, internal simplicity that permits rapid adaptability. You say, my God, that's a strange one, but it really isn't. If you've done all this, you forge those implicit connections or bonds one with the other. You have those shared images, so you can tell somebody to do something, it's done. With that, instead of having these long, detailed orders, new instructions, all that. It's inherent. Now here's the chart in a book that I read, or actually lifted out a book that I ran into about two or three weeks after I talked to Paul, so it really caused these passages to leap out at me in these three pages. The underlying your mind I'll let you read it and I'll comment. I'm trying to make, if you look at these things that underline, they're all related to one of the very direct things you want to refer to at the time. So let's build upon that relationship. And so if we look and start pulling some things together, some insights we can pull up relative to all of the false ideas. All I'm saying is these ideas are related to one another. I showed the previous chart. If we look at those comments, 124, 160, 165, they suggest that moral effects are related to the menace posed by the Zeppelin and the uncertainty associated with not knowing what to expect or how to deal with it. Remember, they never experienced that before. It's a menace, they don't know how to deal with it. So for a first cut, we can say, in some sense, moral effects must be related to menace and uncertainty. It's a way of thinking about it, anyway. But it seems to leave some things out. <coughs> in other words, we don't bring in the collective aspect, the collective moral strength, or what we'll point out here, the idea of trust. Remember, heroic commanders, other people have to try to generate mistrust while talking about having trust. So if you're living in an environment of conflict, adversarial relationships, these things come together. You have to deal with this trust and mistrust. So it really suggests, when you put it all together, that moral strength in some way represents the passive overcome menace, uncertainty, and mistrust. Menace, uncertainty, and mistrust. So building upon that, we're making some definitions here, just as a way of getting into it. So if we go back to Clausewitz. Remember what I told you? He brought up fear, anxiety, and alienation in a noble counterweight, courage, confidence, and spree. If we tie that in with the moral strength, we make these other definitions. Moral victory, moral defeat, moral values, and moral authority. They begin to, they begin to start leaving out it. We start pasting them together. Of course, the one we're going for is moral authority. A person or body can give one courage, confidence, and spree to overcome menace and certainly mistrust. I've got some better ways of talking about that in a minute I'll do, but I want to go through this right now. In fact, I'm going to come out with some new work that I've been doing some research on my own. But he brings it very much related where I say you can't morally isolate somebody, you have to morally isolate yourself. Mentally you can, physically you can, morally you really does the job. You set shape circumstances so it can happen. In a sense, it does Okay, with that in mind, let's pull it together. It's not what I call, at least for a first best essence of moral function. So you're creating exploit magnify these things. Menace, uncertainty, and mistrust. And 
the idea and the aim. That has a very high negative content. So you want some suspicion as far as they have here. It seems to be called one sided. So let's see if we can pick up the positive side. Just like the positive side of the negative emotional factor is also positive. Let's see if we can pick up the positive side. And a way of getting into that is let's just look at with mistrust. The presence of mistrust implies a rough solution to human bond. Suggest harmony in something. We've got to be able to get some kind of harmony so people can build up these bonds of trust. That's one thing. In dealing with uncertainty, you have to have you can't make things certain. Life is not that work that way. You have to be able to adaptable, be adaptable to deal with that uncertainty. And we have to face menace. You just can't say we're going to be friendly. You have to take initiative. You may be unfriendly. On the other hand, you may be able to make it be. So if we paste all these things together, we can, remod we can modify that chart somewhat and look at it a bit different, what I call both negative and positive factors, or counterweights. So we have menace and certain mistrust and counterweights initially. Internal drive to think and take action without being hurt. Adaptability, power to adjust or change. Harmony, interaction apparently disconnected and in a connected way. That doesn't mean they're all one to one. It's kind of one to one. So then you have both a negative aim and a positive aim. Well, I mean, according to your definition, which works real well, moral values are the things a group of people would have in common that enable them to have initiative, adaptability, and harmony among each other. That's one way. I'm taking it deeper. I'm going beyond like the word. What are they? You know what they are? Let's say everybody can do anything they wanted to do. There are no constraints. The Christ, the thing wouldn't hold together. Would it? So both moral values or moral standards, there are constraints on individual behavior so the organic whole can exist. If everybody has freedom of action, you have no organic whole. Well, certainly. The you may tell them what to do, but that's a constraint, as well as not tell them what not to do. That tells them they have to operate in a directed way. That's a constraint on their individual behavior, of one kind or another. I'm going to get into it deeply. That doesn't mean it's bad. Supposedly, in the absence of all constraints, the moral values are what surface. The moral values are the only thing that keep you together in the absence of all constraints. But they are what? How do you, you know, you build up moral values over time because the imprint of your culture now. What thou shalt do or what thou shalt not do or how one will interact with others. So in that sense, a moral value or ethical value is a constraint of one kind or another. How you're going to behave. And that's to allow the group to survive. Think about it. It's not bad, it's good. But in the end, it's some kind of constraint. You just can't give everybody total freedom of action. The whole thing goes to hell. Whether thou shalt do this, or thou shalt not do this, or thou will act this way, or etc. However you want to say it, or ethical practices in business, whatever it is. They don't be written down. It makes no difference. Okay, then, a moral value in some sense, then, Our standards of behavior, codes of conduct, etc. So if you have moral isolation, what do you have? Now we're going to get down to it. I'm going to see I'm trying to, I'm trying to lead you somewhere. When you morally isolate somebody, you really know he isolates himself. Is that's an inability. It's related to the inability of individuals or groups to abide by codes of conduct, standards of behavior, deemed acceptable or essential to others outside. You know, 
the inability to abide by codes of conduct, standards of behavior, or systems of value deemed acceptable or essential to others outside those individuals or groups. So, the alienation takes place is when you violate those codes of conduct and standards because they're deemed acceptable, because it permits the group to exist, and you alienate yourself. Now, some people do it, they try to get away with it, but once it's surfaced and made visible, they're too. In other words, don't hold your friend. going on around yourself. So if you can set up the pace of events or cause things to happen, the guy's mentally isolated, he doesn't know what that was going on. He's disoriented. But we're disorientation. <coughs> so now military tends to think mostly, you know, the cut lines of communication, that kind of stuff. That's physical isolation. Trying to isolate the guy so he can't get sustenance so he can keep his operations as a material aspect. Then you go mental isolation, now you get the guy so he's confused, can't keep up, he starts coming unglued, he gets demoralized. Now, let's assume you demoralize them because of mental isolation, he starts seeing things are coming unglued. And let's say those bonds between them weren't too strong, or there were some little devious things that were done they'd overlook. Now, remember what I said? Defeat is an orphan, and victory has a thousand foils, pretty soon everybody's pointing the finger at everybody else, that's when the moral parts of the base, these things begin to show up. Very important. Okay, with that in mind, let's go to the synthesis. Pattern for successful, successful operation. In one sense, you have to have some kind of a goal or aim in mind. Plan to feed it. Action feed the plan. Support feed the action command. You got to glue it all together. So what are we talking about here? Let's start laying it out. What is our goal? In some sense, what you're trying to do is diminish your adversary's freedom of action while improving yours, so that he cannot cope and you can with things that begin to unfold. Okay. And so when you cut his lines of communication, when you disorient him to the kind of thing we're you're really inhibiting his freedom of action. And so your plan, you want to probe to unmask his strengths, weakness, and maneuvers, in other words, get the right inside the boom. Great sun suit. Employ a variety of methods, interweave medicine, surgery, mistrust of these, tangled of these things, sever his moral ties, disorient his, his mental images, etc. Mass, distort, magnify, hard. Sometimes mass, sometimes distort, sometimes magnify. That in turn gives you the, the ability to select initiative response that is least expected, whether it be more mentally or physical. That'll permit you to establish in these things, establish focus and main effort together with other efforts and pursue directions that permit many happen. Doesn't mean you make them, but you have all kinds of possibilities. Trying to put them in the horns of many dilemmas. Offer many branches and threaten alternative objectives. You can't get a good picture of what's going on. And then to keep that operation going, move along paths of least resistance, right? That allows the paths of least resistance to man manifest themselves. And you just start exploiting it. Keep pulling the system down further. Now here's an interesting one. Exploit rather than disrupt or destroy those differences or those features within his, in his system that interfere with his ability to cope with unfolding Let me give you an example, particularly guerrilla warfare. Gorillas, I'm reporting this one right here. Gorillas 
Plus, if you have a, like a corrupt province chief, don't really like to take them out. Because they take out the corrupt province chief and put someone in your good, then they don't have their basis for the guerrilla movement. So by having a corrupt province chief, they can use that as a recruitment effort to build up their own uh, guerrilla cadre. So they don't want to take that out, unless it's really bad and the people really demand it. Instead, they'll lever that system to build up their own movement. Of course, after they got it made, then they'll take them out and probably execute them. But not at the time when they're using them as a rallying point to build up their own efforts. See what I'm getting at there? Okay, and then subvert, disorient, disrupt, those things allow him to keep his own acting yet. Permit him to keep his ubu. The idea is to dismember him, isolate him from mafia. And the action. He warns the six, he warns the radio. The issue of basis for initiatives being guided into his system, exploit his vulnerabilities. Your support, mobile communication, essential logistics, maintain cohesion. I mean, maintain pace of operation, cohesion, we'll go ahead. And command, I call this command of the light. <coughs> command of the light. As a matter of fact, these ideas I have here are very, very similar to the ones Mao has. Very similar to Mao. Where I have a command. Now, how many people read on his own guerrilla warfare? Anybody? Mao? The last two, like the last two or three pages of the book, we talk about it. Pardon? Pardon? Finally stumped us on one. How's it going, man? Yeah. Very interesting. Agreed. Okay. Now I want to draw your attention to something. I want to draw your attention to the plan and action here. I want to play with you. And what we're suggesting by that plan and action these statements that we talked about previous chart. One, we're trying to penetrate his system, mask our system against his penetration. We're trying to create a variety of impressions of what is occurring, what is about to occur, so we can't keep up with this. Generate mismatch between what seems to be and what is. In other words, try to do the wrong things. And also push him beyond his bill of death. In other words,